Caleb, you spoke to a number of veterans who are going through this, trying to avoid foreclosure, tangling with their lender over trying to figure out a new payment plan. What did they tell you? A word that gets overused a lot these days is Kafka-esque, but for a lot of them, I think that's really what it felt like. Imagine you are trying in good faith to close this documentation you need to keep your home and just finding that it is not happening for a variety of reasons. So a lot of them were very upset, very stressed. We talked to folks like Rosie Bennett, a 79-year-old widow of a Navy veteran out in Idaho, and she has multiple sclerosis, and she was telling us about how this was incredibly stressful and worsening her conditions as she tried really, really hard to close this documentation. My husband and I, we were living here for 28 years in this home. We were in the middle of a um, modification, and they were trying to send me the form to fill out all the contracts and stuff. So they sent me this envelope. I received it with UPS. I opened the envelope, and there was just another envelope in there with nothing else. So I didn't know what that was supposed to mean, and, you know, so I called the company and they said uh, they were going to send me another one and they never did. And what happened after that when she contacted her lender? This is the other maddening thing is all of these borrowers get into these he said, she said, who did, who didn't fights with their lenders and their lenders have these systems of, you know, different times we've called you and they're very often robocalls or different times we've sent you a letter, and most homeowners are just not prepared to have an entire docket at the ready to have these conversations with their lenders because they weren't expecting to have to fight with a lender to continue to pay their mortgage. So at one point, Rosie gets this letter that says, you've run out of time, you haven't submitted your documents, and you need to pay $33,000, which is not money that she has. So in Rosie Bennett's case, she hired an attorney, a a rather high-profile one, a guy by the name of Mark Dan, the former Ohio attorney general, who specializes in cases just like this. Rosie told us that as soon as she hired a lawyer, her lenders started to treat her very differently. She felt she was suddenly getting some modicum of respect that she was not getting before. And so where is that case now? So we reached out to all of the lenders in this story, including Rosie's, PHH, and the other servicer who was involved with Rosie's loan, Devin Mule, which is no longer involved with Rosie's loan. They both said that they had complied with all the applicable laws and guidelines for her loan, and PHH no longer intends to foreclose on Rosie. One thing that's interesting about Rosie is she entirely accidentally ended up in this situation. This home mortgage was originally taken with a bank. The note has been sold several times. The servicing is now with a different company. So, you know, her and her husband never could have known that they would have ended up having their mortgage serviced and owned by non-bank lenders. When they began this process, they began it in the way that a lot of people before 2008 began their mortgage process at a traditional bank. And this is something that happens a lot, right, where you start a mortgage with someone and then it's sold several times and you have no say in who that mortgage is sold to and who's going to be servicing it. That's right. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, the original person who wrote the loan might want to retain the servicing, but there's no standard for that in the U.S. There's nothing requiring it be done a certain way. So it's entirely possible by the time you're done paying off your home or by the time you're selling it that you will have gone through a half dozen servicers and people holding your loan. And Caleb, Rosie Bennett wasn't the only person who you spoke to in this situation. That's right. Another person we spoke to was Makita Young. My name is Makita Tai Young, and I am a major in the North Carolina National Guard. I am a chemical officer. So I purchased my home in Charlotte, North Carolina in 2018. And I would have to say it was such a momentous occasion because I just got clear from cancer and it was something I wanted to do for myself. And it's a beautiful house that sits right in front of Linda Lake. And I knew as soon as I saw it online, I was going to get it. She had a similar situation where she was just sending in her documentation again and again, had her modification agreement approved several times, actually, and then it was suddenly not 
again, uh, which was incredibly maddening to her. And she did end up paying her lump sum payment because she got to the end of that road and she had no other options. And luckily in her case, she was able to afford to do so. But she was a very special borrower insofar as that she was not going to let that be the end of the road for her. She wanted answers. She wanted to figure out what had happened. And she took matters into her own hands. So she reached out to the Department of Justice in her home state of North Carolina to explain what happened. And what the NCDOJ was able to do is they reached out to her lender, Mr. Cooper, and they were like, hey, we heard this about you. What happened? And Mr. Cooper responded, as a lot of these lenders do, saying we tried to reach her many times and she was non-responsive. And for a lot of borrowers, that's the end of the road. That's where they lose. They don't have the documentation at the ready to prove otherwise. But Makita did. She had collated all of her phone records and all of her emails. And she was able to show that Mr. Cooper's documentation of their interactions was incomplete. And after she went through that with the North Carolina Department of Justice, they rescinded their claim to Experian and other credit agencies that she'd been delinquent. And she was able to get her credit restored. But this was after months of labor, essentially working as her own advocate. And what did Mr. Cooper say about that? A spokeswoman for Mr. Cooper told us that Makita Young's application had been denied after all of her documents had been received and that the company is committed to finding solutions to keep customers in their homes. I pass all these billboards onto all the cities I travel to, whether I'm going to drill or a training mission. It says, we will never forget. Support, help, honor the veteran. And the one thing that they told us that they would guarantee us during our service, and that was to honor us, was completely obliterated in a mass hall to take homes. Caleb, for every customer like Rosie Bennett or McKenna Young who are able to push back, There are others who aren't able to keep their homes, and you spoke to some of them, too. One person we spoke to was Monica Rosario, another Army veteran. Monica is somebody who was going through a very hard time in her life already. She was going through a divorce. She's a colon cancer survivor. She was getting disability payments from the VA. I served in the military for eight years um, on active duty, and I was an engineer officer. I purchased a home in August of 2019. I bought this house mainly because I was married at the time, and we decided that we wanted to go ahead and start building a family, so we wanted to buy a house. And she went into another one of these sort of maddening scenarios with her lender, a lender called Freedom Mortgage. She lost her home rather than have it go to foreclosure. She sold it in a short sale. We can see on the listing for the home now that it's been listed for a remarkable markup, I believe over 50% from what she bought it for. And that's the worst case scenario where a veteran is going through a hard time, is not equipped to handle a document battle like this, and then they lose their home. And what did her lender have to say about that case? Freedom Mortgage declined to comment. After the break, will the government step in to stop more foreclosures from happening? From Wall Street to Main Street and from Hollywood to Washington, the news is filled with decisions, turning points, deals, and collisions. I'm Tim O'Brien, the senior executive editor for Bloomberg Opinion. And I'm your host for Crash Course, a weekly podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. Every week on Crash Course, I'll bring listeners directly into the arenas where epic upheavals occur. And I'm going to explore the lessons we can learn when creativity and ambition collide with competition and power. Each Tuesday, I'll talk to Bloomberg reporters around the world, as well as experts and big names in the news. Together, we'll explore business, political, and social disruptions and what we can learn from them. I'm Tim O'Brien, host of Crash Course, a new weekly podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. Listen to Crash Course every Tuesday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Polly, you're right that lenders used to do a lot to work with customers to avoid foreclosure, and now that's no longer the case. Yeah, I mean, foreclosure is frustrating, time-consuming, and expensive. So in order for a mortgage servicer to want to go down that road, they need to have total confidence that they'll be able to recoup their funds out of it. And that typically means that the property is not a short sale, that it's not underwater. That all of a sudden really consistently became the case as real estate prices have absolutely skyrocketed the last couple of years. And they haven't really gone down despite how interest rates are right now. So you're dealing with a very different real estate market than you were, for example, in 2008 and 2009 when the foreclosure crisis was also really significant. But the real estate market looked entirely different. So it used to be the very common adage that foreclosure is never profitable. That is less the case today. Polly, I guess a question a lot of people listening to this might be asking themselves is, where's the government? Where's the Veterans Administration? Where's the Consumer Protection Agency that oversees some of these non-bank lenders to help these veterans? Yeah, so let's talk about what the government actually looks like when it comes to regulating this. So... The VA is where you would think that a lot of regulation could happen, but that's not necessarily the case. They cannot unilaterally decide that a lender doesn't qualify for VA loans. The other big regulator that you often think of is the CFPB, but the CFPB doesn't necessarily do as much as you think they would. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Department of Justice in December 2021 wrote a letter to mortgage servicers and basically said, hey, we're watching and we're dealing with consumer complaints. But that's a letter, right? It's not a regulatory action. And it's certainly not preventing anyone from accessing the VA market going forward. It's just a letter. So then you look at Congress and they have not addressed this matter. So as a result, you have this situation where a lot of people might be watching, but no one has actually done anything. After that December 2021 letter, all of the problems that we've described continued to happen. And the CFPB came back around in another report covering transactions through March 2023 of this year, where they said functionally the same thing. We are seeing this bad stuff happen. As we understand it, borrowers cannot avoid this bad stuff because they count on you, the lenders and servicers, to duly execute these documents. But a problem with that is CFPB did not name the lenders it identified as failing to execute these agreements. And they kind of just said, after we identified these problems, they instituted new policies and procedures and the problem was fixed. Now, again, that was for transactions through March of 2023. And we know just from the borrowers that we talked to that borrowers were still dealing with these problems after the fact. So we talked to people who work in this space, consultants, lawyers, advocates, and they're really frustrated. They feel there's a lack of accountability there and a lack of transparency. And I'll add here that a spokesperson for the CFPB said it doesn't make public its supervisory interactions with companies. Polly, you said that the VA doesn't have a mechanism to decide which lenders to include and exclude, but You also write that the VA has stepped in on behalf of some borrowers to try to solve these problems. Yeah, so I think it's a good thing to contemplate, like, what the VA's responsibility is and how much it can or can't do. So they do have these financial counselors that are meant to serve as an aid to people who are the recipients of these loans. And they do exist and they're there to help. But I think what we've been hearing from the borrowers that Caleb spoke with is that despite those services existing, they're not necessarily the easiest to access, and they're also not necessarily the easiest to actually get something from. And when we spoke with the VA, one thing they said is, you know, we want to keep people in homes. We don't just want to sell them a mortgage. We want to be sure they actually are able to stay in that home and that they need to reach out to us for help. And I think that's something we've been contemplating as we report the story is How much is the veteran supposed to be reaching out constantly versus how much are these institutions supposed to be there to help them when something goes wrong without them having to be proactive? It's totally understandable if someone doesn't want to chase down help if they're expecting it 
because they're in a position they didn't ask for after a pandemic that no one thought would ever happen. Caleb, Polly, thanks so much for sharing your reporting. Thanks for having us, Wes. Thank you. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Bergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Sam Gabauer produced this episode. Rafael M. Seeley is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take.